ReasonConf is brought to you by our gold sponsors, Ahrefs and Chain Street. Hey everybody, uh, we are very happy to be here today at ReasonConf to speak about our journey with React Native and ReasonML. So this is David and I am Amelie and we are both working at Ubisoft in Montreal. More especially, we are working at Ubisoft Club. So the club is an application that you can find on mobile, but you can also find it on console and on web. And the current mobile application has uh, an average of 80K user per day connecting, and it's available on uh, iOS and enfin, Apple devices and Android. And the current production application is written with Angular, Cordova, and Ionic. About uh, one year ago, so this application, because I didn't explain, uh, you connect it using your Ubisoft, Ubisoft account and you get access to your Ubisoft profile, your friends, you can see other games, Ubisoft games that you've been playing, you can have your challenges, uh, unblock some rewards on your games, that kind of stuff. We also have a, a chatbot named Sam, you can speak with and access all your stats and also some uh, advice to get better on your games. So this uh, application uh, was in Angular, as I told you. And about one year ago, the teams decided to go from Angular to React. And it meant for the application in mobile to go to React Native. This was at this point that, that David and I joined the team to work on this reboot on React Native. So about a year ago, I was still in France. Um, and I received a message from Ubisoft telling me, hey, David, going to join the team, and we are going to uh, doing some experimentation on ReasonML. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I read some stuff about ReasonML, and at the same time, I was super confident. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the thing is, I had some knowledge about functional programming because I did some with uh, JavaScript, but at that time, I really felt like functional programming I couldn't really find myself as one. It should be like some math, math genius and stuff like that because I've been in the situation when you, when you don't know um, the exact word of what you're doing, some people can judge you. They can be saying, oh, you're not the real one because you don't know the word or anything. And at that time, I still I had no idea what Monad was. <laughs> like, uh, so I, I guess that probably I was nothing, I was not, uh, like ready to do this. So I, I wanted to be prepared. And I knew at that time that uh, Reason um, community had the Discord, so I went on it to ask for help. And that was my first bit of knowledge of Reason ML. And I found some really kind people. And the first thing they told me is that, okay, so you want to know about functional programming, right? So they gave me the advice of reading like mostly adequate guide to functional programming. I read, I, I, re I actually said the title, I'm really uh, glad. Uh, so this is an excellent book. So if you are JavaScript developers uh, and you have some bit of knowledge or you want to know about functional programming, this book is amazing. Uh, it's funny, it's actually practically the only book uh, technical book, it's not the only book I read, it's the only the technical book I have been able to read. And as you guessed it, we also talked about uh, imposter syndrome. So I was amazed because the community was so kind, like, I didn't know this person, and that was the first thing, and I, I just realized that like, people on the Discord, well, you, <laughs> you're amazing. Uh, so uh, I felt oh, I want to be part of it. So that was the first thing. And eventually, I'm, I'm going to work on Ubisoft, so let's try this. And I want to, like, before talking about the application, uh, explain to you um, what was my way of going to Reason and what makes sense to me. So I was a JavaScript developer. And um, I like, I, I still love to do JavaScript because JavaScript is the fun language with a lot of possibilities. It's like a sandbox for everything. You can start on it and you do whatever you want. but when it comes to functional programming, uh, which come very trendy these days, uh, you realize that you're gonna start to patch it a lot, like make it, I, I want to use constantly, I want to have TypeScript, I want to make immutability, like stuff like that. And in the end, with some tools, you're gonna use it to build it to JavaScript. And for me, like it, it start to like lose sense for me. And then I realized that Reason was kind of, uh, kind of the real thing, uh, powered by OCaml. 
Uh, and in the end, it's doing the same things, like I can build it to JavaScript. So for me, that was my first bit, and I helped people to convince that we should use it because of these points. Just a bit of context about myself as well. So just like David, uh, I am still a JavaScript developer, and I've been doing a lot of React. And I was very happy to come to Montreal about six months ago to join the team and do some uh, React Native. It was kind of the same because it's still all the React ecosystem. It's a bit different because it's mobile and it's not the same problems, the same platform and all. So I was really happy. But the first day I joined the team and I was sitting at my, at my desk the first day and they came to me and say, okay, but we decided that we won't be doing JavaScript, but instead it's gonna be reason ML. So it was hard. I didn't knew reason was a thing, if I have to be very honest. Uh, I didn't, didn't know much about functional programming. So it was really hard. And again, I, I was sitting at my desk and I have all my knowledge is about JavaScript and I know that I couldn't use them anymore. So in order to survive, I set up myself some steps to follow. The first one was know how to declare stuff. And by that, I mean know the types that, ca that I can use. So I went to uh, this site that I think that you all know uh, to understand what types I could use, what types exist, and that kind of stuff. What uh, really pleased me was this cheat sheet that, that you can find that shows all the similarities and differences between uh, JavaScript and uh, Reason. And it, it was very reassuring because uh, you found a lot of similarities in the end. So quickly, I was able to declare stuff, yay! So the second step was to build actual uh, React Native components. And we were at the very beginning of the application, so we had to construct the first, first bricks, so some dialogues and that kind of stuff. Uh, so to do that, I went, went of course, uh, in a React Native website, and then I went to Reason React website, and again, it was very reassuring because the way you declare components was kind of similar of what I was doing in JavaScript, so quickly I was able to construct my components as well. But as, at some point, I needed to set up some styles on my components, my React Native components, and to do that, sometimes you have to use some variants and to know those variants, what kind of variants you can use. Uh, I didn't know if it was camel case or lower case or that kind of stuff. So I tried to go on BS React, React, uh, BS React Native documentation and that was it. So <laughs> it was at that point that I understood that I couldn't rely so much on the documentation. So it was hard, but I understood that I will have to read a lot of source code from that. And I found this kind of stuff on the source code. And coming from JavaScript, this is really hard to understand. You have all these keywords, you know this is signature and all, but really, it's really, really hard to understand. So my pro tip for people like me, who are very lost, is to go directly on the interface file. We, you will find some concrete example of how, how to use the components. And so you will be able to construct components, but also you can infer how the reason file uh, is created and how, how it works. And it was very cool because I learned a lot and I was able to construct my components this way. So we had all these small components and we wanted to uh, have a way to uh, combine them. Uh, so to do that, we installed a storybook, which is uh, some kind of a playground you can have to uh, have your components. So we have the list of our components, how they are displayed on the mobile, and we also have the knobs. You can play with the props to, uh, to change the color or the props of your components. So it was really cool and it pleased us and the de designers as well. So I was here and again, the application was at the very beginning and I wanted to do something that I used to do in my previous doc, uh, work in here. And so I wanted to have some quality in the project. And for me, it was important to set up some tests in this purpose. So what is really cool with Reason is that you are such in a in strong typing ecosystem that you already have a lot of safety. You don't need to test as much things as you needed to do in JavaScript. 
that was cool. And anyway, we had just some dumb component to test, so we, we wanted to check the visual aspects of our components in order to avoid regressions in the future. To do that, before I used Jest, and hopefully there is a BS Jest existing that I could use. So BS Jest allows us to compare snapshots, but I needed to make my snapshots. And so to find the right library for that, I went to Redex, typed test React, and that as the first library that comes up was BS React test renderer. And it was cool because it was kind of the one I was using also before, and I was able to have my first snapshot test here. So for this component, uh, this is a snapshot that was generated. As you can see, there is the name of the component at the top, and you have the styles. And if, yeah, if I had some uh, React Native components embedded, I would have seen them as well. It was really cool. But for some more complicated, complex uh, components, and by that I mean components that embed uh, custom components, you have that kind of stuff. So it's not really complex, as you can see. Yeah? But still, you have, again, the hierarchy of your components with the style and all, but you also have that. And that is the name of the embedded uh, component I have, and a reason prop array. And this is kind of a shame, because this is half the job we wanted our snapshot to do. We don't have the props passed to the children component, and we don't also have the values that we pass. So I was like, uh, this is not exactly what I want. Oops, sorry. This is not exactly what I wanted my snapshot to, to be. Um, this is half the information. And we don't have a, a, a real solution here. So what we found as a solution for our team was to have so shallow components on the dumb components, on the very uh, low level component, like those one. Even if it means that sometime we will have reason props uh, displayed, we accept that. But we also have a deep snapshot on the screen, so the top level components. And by deep snapshot, it means that we uh, have the, um, the hierarchy of components generated directly with Re reason uh, React Native. And so we don't have the name of the custom component we use. So there are very big snapshots. And this is not ideal, but this is a solution that we found to avoid uh, as much regression as possible for the future. So at that time, uh, we were able to uh, show all the, the components of the rendering was, uh, that's, uh, that was something that we were able to do. So we found at this point that we were still doing an experiment like it was. Uh, we were doing uh, the components, but uh, we don't have the data. So we have to do the real thing, uh, make it happen, make the feature work and everything. And uh, that time we were like reading a lot about Apollo. And uh, we felt, ah, it feels great. Uh, I feel like doing the state management on the server could make sense. Uh, so without any knowledge of GraphQL, well, let's try this. Uh, so the first feature we did was a feed, a social feed. Uh, so it's, that's what you saw uh, just before. Uh, the, Sorry, hey, uh, is the social feed. And uh, we wanted to try this thing, but with, for the first try, we wanted to try a very simple version of it. So, started with the first schema, and uh, uh, with only just uh, post with text, post with images. So it's a very simple schema. Uh, you can have text or image, and everybody has an idea. Uh, so that was on the server. So OK, this thing kind of worked. Uh, so now I'm going to try on the client to see if I can gather the data and run something. Uh, so with the help of GraphQL PPX, uh, I was able to do a query and generate data, which is amazing uh, for a reason. And then. Let's start to render, or let the data is here. I can grab it, like, and let's start to render it. Oh, that's cool. So I have a feed, which should be an array. Yeah. OK. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, so the field should be an array, so with a text and image in it. So let's map on it. And then I discovered that uh, that's actually an optional. OK, so I'm going to switch on it, but then I'm going to be able to map on it. So I map on it, and then I'm going to use the data inside. And then the data inside I can use, and that's an optional too. So that's uh, 
Okay, so, okay, I'm, I'm switching on it, that's no problem. So now I have the I have the feed item, so I can use the now image, and then you guessed it, uh, what's inside it, also optionals. <laughs> So optionals everywhere. Uh, we were able to show a text and an image. Uh, you can guess it, a, feed, a social feed is way more than that. So we were like kind of, uh, that's gonna be our feature, like all the, the products gonna be like that. This is a very simple example. So the server is all servers, not like we are uh, describing an API for other people and us, it's like our Apollo server. And the question we're gonna start it to have is what are the options anyway? Are we doing something wrong in GraphQL? We are uh, kind of, we are all beginner in this project. And then we realize that there is a way to actually say with GraphQL, I want this to not be an option. And this way is to add an exclamation point. So it was like, okay, so maybe we have a solution in there. But then we realized that, okay, the idea is already there, but sometimes we have text and sometimes we have image. So we came with this uh, feature of GraphQL, uh, with describing an interface and implementing, in the case of an image, uh, the, uh, the image and then the text, the text. So it's still pretty readable. So from this point, it was uh, working on the server. We could like do some tests and everything. So we were like, okay. So what is going to be with GraphQL PPX? So we try with the uh, the same thing we would do uh, on the. Um, on the GraphQL playground, and it seems to be okay with it. So, okay, so let's try that. It's exactly the way we discovered like the thing. Uh, so let's try to render it. So, same thing, I have a feed, I want to render, and this time, oh, it's not an option, or I can map on it, that's very cool. And then what is a GraphQL PPX doing when you have several choice and different data in it? The best thing you could do with, uh, reason is uh, it's using variants. That's amazing, that's something. At that point, we realized that the whole application makes sense. Like, it's just like, we, we had like Lego, like everything we were like, we were matching together. But it's still a PPX, okay? So uh, as you can imagine, it has flaws also, it's young, uh, as everything in the reason community, of course. Uh, so sometimes, if you are adding something in your schema and you are doing a mistake, uh, you're gonna have this pretty log uh, with all the feed and everything. And if you want to find uh, your uh, your like element in there, well, good luck. Uh, that's not the best part of the job. But despite this, uh, GraphQL PPX is an amazing tool. It's just that it's not one lib. It's as important for us as Reason React, as all the libs you are used to uh, work with, and Reason itself, because uh, it gives us the opportunity to uh, decode the JSON for us, and that's a big deal. Because, well, this is something that we also quickly understood was that you don't want to have so much JSON in your application. Actually, having JSON, it means that for each field that you have on your JSON, if you want to use it in your reason, you have to decode it and type it in a way that reason understands. And that's normal in a sense because you, you want to have types on things that you use. But at the begin beginning of the application, we had this file, which was basically a configuration file. As you can see, it's like maybe eight fields, not so much nesting, but just for that, we had to write all this code, and it's not even all the code that we needed. It's not that complicated, it's not a problem, it's just like it's very verbose, and it's hard to maintain just for that. And we couldn't have imagined to have a whole REST API to have, so we were very happy to have GraphQL at this point, but there is sometimes that you cannot avoid to have JSON. This is a case, for instance, so again, this is a news feed that you have when you log in. So you have that, and you scroll, you scroll, you scroll, and when you reach the bottom of the page, you have a loading spinner appearing, and we load the next feed to show you. And the job is to put the new feed below the ancient one. And it looks simple. The problem is that, you guessed it, in both sides, we have JSON. So 
the first attempt that we had, so we were beginning beginner at this point, so the first attempt we had was to use BS row. Because concatenate to JSON in JavaScript is quite straightforward. This is uh, just, uh, yeah, just that actually. And so it was cool. It allowed us to continue uh, with the rest of the code uh, by the time we found another solution. And we decided not to go with that in the end because in the end it's BS row and we don't want to inject JavaScript as much as possible in the code. So the second attempt was to kind of cheating. Uh, so we have our two JSON and we uh, just decode the first level of the JSON, concatenate them and re-encode them. So this is a, a small trick that we had, it's a hack, uh, but it's enough for us because in the, in the end we have GraphQL just before that and we know that our data are safe already and we can trust them. So we do that, it's enough and it's working for us right now. Uh, and this kind of thing is occurring because uh, we are missing something with uh, from GraphQL PPX that is not able to uh, do the serialized uh, thing, like, like we can come back to JSON. And this is part of the job uh, when you're working with ReasonML. Uh, it's because it's young, so we, we have to work, like we have to help on the features and everything. But that's not that bad because most of the time, well, every time a library is just a bunch of module. So when you have a feature, most of the time just impacting one module. Uh, so what we're doing is that we isolate it and we put it directly in our code. Uh, and we are going to use like the library. And for this particular uh, module, we're gonna use this one with a diff with the feature we want to use. And when we're going to let it incubate a bit in our code, like to be sure it's working and everything. And when we find it's something that could help the community while it's coming back to the, uh, to the library. So that's very cool because uh, the, the fact that the, um, the community is young and the language and everything uh, make us doing open source and we really love to do that. The other thing that is quite different and that's something that we miss uh, uh, since we are not doing JavaScript are the guidelines. Uh, we're kind of lost. We have no idea what we're doing. Uh, so we try to find our way to define our guidelines in the code. So the first thing we're doing is that, so we're using Refinity uh, as a prettier thing in our code uh, and sometimes just we, we have no idea what Refinity is uh, choosing uh, as rules to uh, define how it's going to, uh, to uh, reformat your code. So we kind of look at what it did. It did. It <laughs> did. Uh, so um, that's the first thing. And from there, we kind of infer rules. Uh, the other thing is that, as Amelie told you, we are reading a lot of source code because documentation is not already there. Not a, like a lot of things are happening. Some, sometimes source code is here before documentation. So, and we want the feature already. So we read the, the interfaces. And sometimes you're gonna find some same pattern between uh, libraries. So you try to figure like maybe this is a good thing to do. The other thing, so I already trolled a lot about it on Discord, <laughs> is that we're not OCaml developers. Uh, we can read ReasonML, like, no, that's kind of our second language. We can read ReasonML without any problem, but for OCaml, we have no idea. Like, when we open the file, it's like a bunch of, like, I don't know, we, I don't know what it's doing. And again, reference it's a super tool. Like, I'm using it to do for reformat to reason, and then I can read the library, and I can understand what they did, and from this, I can apply this to my code, and that's very cool. And last but not least, uh, that's most important thing, like we talk a lot about it, like we talk about uh, guidelines all the time, like, oh, now we should do the style like this, we could uh, uh, change the way of doing components using query, blah, blah, blah. So uh, that's cool. Uh, and and the last word, like as a conclusion, um, I found it was not, it was a bit, uh, pretentious to say uh, what you should do uh, to like production or make it happen in production. I think it would be easier to tell you 
what make us liking using it in production. So the first thing is the amazing library that are out there that are already ready to prod. Uh, you can see that I have kind of a romance with GraphQL PPX. Uh, that's <laughs> that's really my, my, this is kind of magical unicorn thing. I don't know what it's doing, but it's doing really great. Uh, and uh, the, the real important thing is that you have to uh, like accept right now that you're gonna use some library that are not ready to use, that are not ready to prod. That's fine, because you still have Buckle Script, you still have a lot of tool that uh, make you uh, the possibility to uh, mix it with a bunch of, Java, uh, a bunch of JavaScript. Uh, that's okay. Uh, so when we started the application, React Navigation, there was a lot of attempts with Rebolt and everything, and uh, we, we really thought that the easier way would be to use the JavaScript one for now. So uh, right now, it's still the, the only part of JavaScript we have in the application is the, the mapping of the, like the router. Uh, but which is cool is that uh, the community is super enthusiastic and uh, BS React Navigation is nearly there. Like, they already have something amazing, but we, we are still waiting some kind of navigation elements, and uh, at one point we're going to refactor. And talking about refactoring, that's maybe the most important thing that makes a reason really likable in the team. Um, this body is, is, is having your back. It's already there, like, always there. Like, you have a watcher, and he's saying, hey, I think you forgot something in here. Uh, maybe you should uh, fix it. And uh, it makes refactoring a lot easier. And we are an agile team. That's not uh, that original. But uh, we believe in uh, iterative uh, coding. And refactoring and being able to refactor easy, easily, it's, uh, it's a game changer. So in our team, we are refactoring all the time. We are writing feature refactoring and learning through the refactors. And that's really the, the kind of reason that makes us really like reason and that make this thing happening. Thank you. <laughs>